Great. So on behalf of NIFA, I'd like to welcome you all back to this virtual space. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Kim Zito, Program Director for Public Art here at the New England Foundation for the Arts. And my colleague, Maria Carrington, is the other half of our public art team. And we'll be supporting uh, the tech this afternoon. Um, and as I mentioned this morning at NIFA, we recognize that although we may be meeting virtually, we acknowledge that greater, the greater Boston region where we live and work encompasses the traditional and unceded lands of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag people. And we honor their ancestors past, present, and future. This collaboration between NEPA's public art team, Erin Ginia, and Elizabeth James Perry um, is our work to move beyond a few words spoken at the beginning of our meetings into action. At NEPA, we recognize that a land acknowledgement alone is insufficient and that as an institution working in this region, we have a role in the shared work towards collective liberation and decolonization. Um, this afternoon, I'm joined by Elizabeth James Perry, Tani Atenaro, Growing Thunder, and Erin Genia. And unfortunately, um, Carrie Helm won't be able to join us today, um, but I'm sure this will still be a very rich conversation. <laughs> um, as Erin mentioned, uh, we will be discussing um, how issues of cultural appropriation, authenticity, and privileging the Western gaze creates a host of challenges for Native artists uh, to, to surmount when working in the public sphere. Our speakers will be unpacking and con confronting some of the complexities of Indigenous art in public space, and we'll discuss how uh, public art practitioners can develop strategies to address these issues. Um, so with that, I would love to uh, invite our speakers to actually introduce themselves, to um, share a little bit about who you are and, and the work that you do and, um, and where, where you're located, what tri tribal territory are you on at the moment? I can pick on someone. <laughs> um, maybe we'll start with Elizabeth. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just saw the mute box pop up. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm Elizabeth James Perry, and I'm an enrolled citizen of the Aquina Wampanoag tribe on the island of Nope off the coast of Massachusetts. I have um, strong ties to the Boston areas um, over multiple generations in multiple ways. And um, one of the most notable ways is through the Sachem Matak from whom I'm descended. His father was Natoxit from Shawmut in Massachusetts territory. And he married into the leadership line at Gay Head or Aquina. And so I am descended and also you know, family members through generations were shipping out of Boston, um, whaling in the Navy, in the colonial Navy, in the regular Navy. Um, generations of family also did business uh, as merchants and things in Boston as well, um, and got their educations there. So uh, there's, there's long-term links um, with, with our various indigenous spaces and the uh, municipalities that grew over basically the footprint of our traditional villages in our territory. I'm here in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, which is a Ponagansett um, in a Coxit uh, village area uh, on the coast here new, near New Bedford. And, um, you know, as a whaling descendant, I come from generations of folks who were very comfortable on the land, but also extremely comfortable on, on water. And I continue that and my brother continues that tradition as well. Um, and the water was how we got around. So, you know, as many communities that there are in this region, we were all constantly visiting and trading and bringing news and supporting each other in times of duress. Um, and uh, yeah, those, those ties are really important to maintain and think about because I think it strengthens the work that we do going forward for the next generations of Native artists in New England and beyond. Um. We'll, we'll go to Tani next. Hi, good morning or afternoon, uh, depending which time zone you're in. I'm Tani Atonharjo, Growing Thunder, 
and I am a member of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma, and I'm also a descendant of Creek and Seminole tribes. I um, am a resident of Oklahoma City, but I have long ties to New England. Um, I previously attended school there and worked there for many years, but also uh, prior to my um, relocation to New England, they the early um, recognition that I have is being a daughter of an artist who um, was, her career was uh, emphasized in New England, uh, specifically with the Haffin River Museum at Brown University. And those ties lead back to my grandfather's, um, his contributions to the museum with his tribal knowledge, but then also um, with the collections there that are at Peabody at Harvard, and some of the other museums that are located. So I've had a lifelong relationship uh, to New England museums and arts associations uh, before I was even born. <laughs> and um, it was uh, not a second guess that I would attend college uh, back East because it was something that was so dear to my heart for um, the contributions in which they made to my grandfather and my mother's careers. Um, that being said, I'm a curator. I am also a museum professional by degree. I am a uh, museologist. I'm not an art historian. And I also uh, include that with a business degree. So I look at arts and humanities and museum practice through the lens of metrics. And so I'm very involved with donor dollars and contributions for nonprofits and have stepped into a new role over the past five years of working with the authenticity of what it is for Native arts. And so we're um, approaching a major gap in arts and humanities and in museum collections. And that's why I'm here today to lend my support and voice to the arts of New England and help in any way possible. So thank you for inviting me. Glad to have you. Um, and Erin, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. I think I just got kicked out of the meeting and but now I'm back. <laughs> Some Wi-Fi issues, although everything should be fine. Um, um, I'm Petu Washte. I am Erin Genia. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a tribal member of the Sisseton Wapitan Oyate, and my reservation is located in uh, the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota. I'm also descended from the Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa. Um, my cur I currently reside in Medford, Massachusetts, which is the traditional tribal territory of the Massachusetts people. Um, and I'm, I'm an artist. I'm a multidisciplinary artist and a cultural worker and educator. Um, I'm currently serving as an artist in residence for the city of Boston. Um, in my, in my work, whether it is my artwork or my um, cultural community work, I always uh, center Dakota philosophy and values. And um, I try to amplify the powerful presence of indigeneity on the occupied lands of the United States of America. It's, um, I, I like to work with other native artists. I like to be with around other native artists and um, and see the kind of work that they're doing. Um, I come from a family lineage of artists and that, that goes back many generations and it continues with my kids who are also artists. Um, alongside this arts practice, I have worked in the fields of tribal governance, um, Native American higher education, um, and indigenous peoples arts and culture and heritage resources, um, serving in various roles at the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center, uh, which is a Native arts organization located in Olympia, Washington. And that's actually where I first met Elizabeth and became enamored with her work. Um, I uh, came here to, um, actually I had grown up in New York, um, and I came here, I returned to the East Coast to um, get my graduate degree at the Art, Culture, and 
technology program at MIT and had previously um, attended school um, at Institute of American Indian Arts and um, the Evergreen State College. And um, so I'm, I'm just really excited to be here to talk about this issue of cultural appropriation because it's like, uh, as a Native artist, it's everywhere. And it's, um, it's a very difficult issue to deal with sometimes um, when talking to non-Native non people about our work. And so I think to have this opportunity to chat with my fellow panelists and to have this audience is a, really a, an honor. So thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for grounding us in who you are and, and where you're coming from. Um, maybe we can just dive right in and start with um, what is cultural, cultural appropriation to you and, and what's the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural sharing? Um, and I'll just open it up and we can have this be more conversational. Sure, I could, uh, I could chime in with a couple of, of examples. Um, just thinking about my various experiences, I've worked as a traditional artist in the New England area for decades, um, and I've also traveled the country. I think um, I can think of some examples right here at home because sometimes those are the ones that, that strike you the strongest, right? Uh, one is the Bassasoit statue in Plymouth. Um, and I think it's the, it feels like the strong appropriation of Wampanoag past and presence and continuance because it's solidified in a stone figure that was um, a composite and I think that the artist actually used uh, an African-American person for the, the, uh, the physique because he decided that that was going to be best. And I think that the statue was actually commissioned maybe by the Order of the Red Men. Um, and so it's a piece not conceived of by Wampanoag people, and this is our territory. Um, it's a piece that is focused on the lone individual that is portrayed in popular culture as the friendly Indian. Um, it's kind of like the big friendly giant. I don't know, it, it sort of takes on this, this mythic stature that depersonifies the individual, um, that removes the presence that would surround him of tribal council, um, of clan mothers, of people of, of various ages that had a stake in, in our history and our continuance and worked really hard together to, to try to make things work here and to maintain our presence and our homelands and protect our resources and, and life ways. Um, so it's a simplified version of history that is, it, it feels very manipulated and it's a little bit eerie, I think, to be an indigenous person, um, native person from Massachusetts and look at a, a statue that, you know, you can imagine that people thought they had good intentions by erecting, but as a native person, I don't feel that it reflects our culture. Um, I don't feel that it reflects the way that we tend to honor and portray um, ourselves or our history or our presence um, in our diplomacy and our priorities. I don't feel it's inclusive because it's, it's, the, it's the guy image, of course you know how could you have a woman up there that would be sacrilegious um yeah i mean there, there's just a lot to it uh that that that's not quite right and then there's the portrayal itself where he's just wearing a little bit of clothes um you know which is fine if if he was having a fishing day but he doesn't have his gear in his hand so you know like what's that um he, he's a leader and a diplomat um he actually if you want to split hairs, would actually be dressed in finery, which is art um, and culture and expressive. Um, tattooing is, is art and culture and expressive. It's also spiritual. So there's layers of meaning that have been stripped and he's been sort of this manipulated figure portrayed in a certain way from a certain viewpoint for all time. I mean, the statue has been there for about a hundred years now and um, you know, easily people could go down the road of making a lot more. Um, and there, you know, that type of statue is interpreted in similar ways. Um, there's another one uh, on the Amherst, uh, UMass Amherst campus, 
um, I think is the, the individual that he's supposed to be portraying is Medawamp. Um, I'm not sure if that's an accurate transcription of, of his indigenous name, um, but a person in leadership out in that region that supposedly very generously just gave the white people his land. <laughs> um, and so again, it's the, this weird friendly Indian uh, giving away resources freely mystique. And if you're an average native person with various you know, experiences, priorities, interests, concerns about the environment, um, very specific, very detailed ways that you've been given knowledge, you know, culture bearing uh, capacity, um, those aren't rich figures that have uh, a lot to give a native audience. And when I'm doing my work, when I'm creating art, when I'm sharing art, when I'm staging an exhibit, my first audience is always na a native audience. Um, I'm always thinking about my tribal community at Aquina. I'm always thinking about um, Herring Pond and Mashpee as well. I'm, I'm thinking about um, all of the other folks in the New England area from various nations um, that are related to us, that have worked with us over time, and the visitors to this area as well, and thinking, you know, what do I want to share? What are, what's my priority to share? What, what do I want to make sure it gets handed down? Um, what do I think the next generation is going to get out of this? And I'm, I'm just not so clear on what the next generation has been able to get, if anything, out of these representations of Native people that are portrayed as well-meaning, but that, that aren't grounded um, in Native values, and they, they're not rich, and they're not from a variety of viewpoints. It's a very sort of very specific privileged viewpoint. The other thing I guess I would share, um, which is a, a kind of an interesting story about appropriation, but not focused on art, is about um, being in Western Massachusetts, where you know clearly there there has been over time a lot of erasure, and there was a very poor narrative of how Indians must have all been gone from Massachusetts from 1630 on, and it was a very arbitrary date with no information attached to it. And I I definitely had some pushback. I was told, oh, it's Mount Greylock, named after Greylock, but we don't know if he was ever on it. And I said, I think if you walk by, it would be hard to miss the biggest mountain in Massachusetts, don't you? And um, so, you know, I, I usually kind of question those kinds of narratives. So I was doing a site visit when I was working for the tribe, looking for historic uh, sites of historic concern, basically for, for, you know, tribal historic preservation purposes. So, you know, hopefully you can avoid impacting sacred lake places, um, really special plants, um, village sites, things like that. Um, if you're putting through recreational areas, trails, you know, whatever, you, whatever it is you're building structures. And so I'm doing some site visits with this person who was designing a, a network of trails. And um, he said he really liked the story, Last of the Mohicans. And I said, well, why? And he said, oh, I thought it was a really nice portrayal of Eastern Native people. And, you know, the, there was nobility and gentleness and, you know, knowledge of the forest and I said yeah but they're portrayed as they portrayed us as all gone in New England and the last of is is a, a really damaging narrative and he said why I think it's a really positive story and I said how does a story that lovingly talks about the last of us dying and getting out of the way help you to deal with me here in the woods where I say Gee, you know, from my tribal perspective, uh, my community is concerned about the following things here. We'd like for you to avoid this, you know, make sure you're consulting with other tribes. How does it prepare you to deal with actual native people that are your neighbors? So yeah, those were my, my challenging uh, yeah. experiences. Thank you so much for that. One thing that we like to talk about in our public art department here at NEPA is that context is really important for public art making. And something that you're making me think about is the whole idea of for whom, by whom, and what is the story that you're trying to tell? Um, and how does that play into cultural appropriation um, versus cultural sharing? Um, thank you. Um, Erin and Tani, um, would love to hear your thoughts. Sure, yes. Um... Well, I, I guess 
I've, I've often encounter people um, within the dominant society who don't understand what cultural appropriation is or why it's wrong. Um, many people believe that um, wrongdoings against Native Americans are all in the past, but cultural appropriation is a contemporary and ongoing wrongdoing. And it matters um, because it represents a continuation of an approach to Native people that involves theft. Um, and it requires an unequal balance of power um, you know, between, between the parties. And it's really harmful for those who are recovering from cultural genocide. Um, at its core, cultural appropriation is basically taking aspects of um, indigenous people's cultures for monetary or personal gain. Um, and I think it's really no less than a continuation of the colonial dispossession of native people. Um, you know, historically, American settlers took every unjust advantage to gain the land and natural resources belonging to native people uh, through corrupt treaty making, murder through policies based on dehumanization of Native people. And this country, as it exists today, would not exist uh, without that theft. Um, I guess I feel that this cultural appropriation is a natural component of that, unfortunately. Um, it's, this, it's based upon theft, and it's propped up sort of by this kind of notion of, of that Settlers have a divine right um, to that which belongs to Native people. And that tends to override any ethics of surrounding kind of these conversations. Um, you know, the supremacy, this um, kind of this, this is the trajectory of manifest destiny. Um, and so I feel that, um, you know, that this cultural appropriation continues in today's market, you know, market, consumer markets where you see um, Native people's designs and images in um, things that are available for sale by large corporations. Um, you see it in the fields of art and academia where people who kind of take on a Native persona to, um, you know, gain personal or professional advantage. Um, I mean, there's just so many examples of this. Like every week, I feel like there's a new news story about these things. Um, and, you know, sometimes people will say, they'll defend it. They'll say, you know, oh, it's just simply cultural sharing. Um, but it, how can that be when the, the parties are not on equal footing? There's not equal distribution of goodwill on both sides. You know, it's the dominant power that is continuing to, um, you know, create unequal conditions uh, for Native people. So, um, you know, I guess in, in my own personal work, I also do a, a lot of museum research and I look at um, Chanupa Iyong so pipestone pieces in different museum collections. And, um, you know, in spending time with those pieces, I um, realized that through the taking of this country and through the, the genocide and the cultural genocide that ha has happened, that um, Native people, you know, as Native people, uh, for, in me in particular, ha have a lot of work to do to um, learn about my cultural heritage. Um, things have been taken away. Things have been, um, you know, I have to like relearn my language um, because of the boarding schools and because of different assimilation policies. And so, to have um, cultural appropriation happen on top of that is, um, it's just like one more thing on top of having to do this, you know, this work of, of dealing with this, um, these colonial systems. So that's, I guess that's my, my feeling about cultural appropriation, what it is and why it presents so many barriers to, um, like fully realizing native arts and especially in public space too, you know, as Elizabeth mentioned, these monuments that are 
portraying Native people in, in really uh, kind of ridiculous ways. Um, so, so that's, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, thank you for sharing that, Erin. And I, many of the things that you speak of resonate with the work that I do as a curator and being a member of the Association of Art Museum Curators and being a member of the American Alliance of Museums and uh, formerly with NEMA, um, some of you that might be online, a part of the organizations and previously working with NEFA. And, you know, cultural appropriation is hard as is when we're going against the stereotypes and we're going against um, the costume and the imagery that we always see. And then <clears throat> for us as Native people, we want to say that this is going to be a hard conversation. It might be hard to listen to if you're regionally located in New England or if you're regionally located in the Southeast. Because we do have this concept in nonprofits, we do have this concept in arts and humanities that we're going to be, we are the world. And um, many are under this impression that you can't ask to authenticate an individual or in the fear of ice or in the fear of, um, offense that we're going to offend somebody by asking them for their authentication that that really gets us into a lot of problems as nonprofits as arts organizations because you're not asking the hard questions and if you're asking a native american person from the united states a federally recognized tribe we're used to it um the three of us uh, elizabeth and aaron and i we talked about the appropriation and what we are standing against now, and we ourselves as art practitioners and people in the field have to even change our terminology within the past year, in the past two years. And now that we're at a place of social justice in the United States, um, we are in a good spot to make change, but we are going to have to ask you among the organizations to understand what our plea is today when it comes to cultural appropriation because it can't just be indigenous it has to be native american so when you're speaking of indigenous you're talking about everybody in the world anybody with indigeneity who has a culture who has a language and a, a ethnic practice so if we're going to say we're going to include indigenous people that means you got to be prepared for the floodgates to open and everybody want to jump on board. But what we're asking as artists and we're asking as uh, these professionals who are charged with putting that art forward, we're needing you to understand what the policies are and the legalities and how we got to where we are as Native peoples of the United States because the Indian Organization Act took place it's there. There are laws in place who say you must fund us, you must hire us. And these are federal programs, no matter if it's going to be the NEA, the NEH, IMLS, your nonprofit dollars are specified by law that you have to serve and include us. But what we're finding over the past two years are great injustices in the arts and humanities because of cultural appropriation. So we do have somebody who might be five to six generations removed from their indigeneity in a different country, say for instance, South America or, you know, of Norway. And, you know, we don't want to come off as xenophobic about this practice, but we also want you to know how to find us and how to include us. And that's what my role is really, is to promote the art that Aaron and Elizabeth work on. But when it's in public spaces too, really over the past five years, we've had two Native American artists who are federally recognized be in public art. One is Bill Glass of the Cherokee Nation. The other one is Jeff Gibson um, of the Choctaw Nation. And those are the only two artists that we can recognizably say who have art out there. 10 years prior to that, it was Bob Halzus of the Apache tribe. And um, that's in the Northwest Coast area. So we want to encourage you to find these artists and not have 
um, so much of a hardship. <laughs> and so if I can offer any resources today, we'll, we'll make that available to Kim and um, share that if you have further questions. But I, I did want to say thank you for bringing that up, Aaron, because it means a lot. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, yeah, and, and thinking more specifically about um, public art, what, I, I, Elizabeth, thank you so much for bringing such um, local examples of cultural appropriation right here um, to light in this conversation. And thinking um, about this morning's conversation about place and space, um, I'm just wondering, like, how are we, how are we supporting more indigenous, indigenous artists, more Native American artists to um, be able to be making public art here um, on their own land? And um, I hear you needing to, like, how, how do we, I guess, I think I lost my question here, but <laughs> um, yeah, what, what, what can we do here to help bridge some of the gaps um, so that, yeah, also as an organization, um, is it our role to, um, you know, how do we, how do we, how, how, how should we better um, identify or what tools might there be for organizations to better identify um, cultural appropriation coming through maybe a grant application or, um, yeah, Sarah, that was a messy question, but. <laughs> I, can, I can take a stab at it and then perhaps um, Aaron and Tani would like to have something to say as well. Um, Kim, we've had some, some good conversation uh, leading up to this symposium and I've appreciated those talks uh, along with Aaron. And, um, you know, we've definitely identified some things that have been characteristically missing in the Boston area. I can say I, I'm getting close to 50 years old and uh, I've lived in Massachusetts most of my life, you know, short stint in Maine um, and, you know, short traveling trips, but it doesn't really count for living somewhere else. Um, and I have a recognizable tribal community. Everybody knows where it is. At least I think I, everybody knows where it is on Martha's Vineyard and has been there for many thousands of years. Um, have been really involved in my culture for my entire life. Um, know a lot of the other players in the broader New England area, but especially Massachusetts. And have worked with some organizations and agencies in various capacities, including for art. Um, I brought up that I was cleaning my attic and I found um, a native artist directory, a, a slim volume, uh, you know, black and white print. And I was thinking that it was the more recent NIFA artist directory um, that Don Spears, who was the program officer for a while in the native program at, at NIFA, had um, produced probably around 2010 or 2012. And, um, but I glanced at it and I noticed the date was like 1992 or something like that. And I thought, oh, okay, this is not the same directory. And I found myself in it, um, you know, with my, my medium listed. And uh, I saw a lot of, of other folks, uh, performers and speakers and artists in there as well. And um, I remember we had a talk and I said, well, how long has NIFA been around? You know, or, we're, we're in this repeating cycle potentially of, of these directories that come out. Um, and there's expectations, I think, on both sides, but what does it take? What is the, the sort of the heavy lifting that it takes to, to push the relationship, I guess, to the next level? One is maintaining the relationships. Identifying tribes, um, hopefully there's more depth of interest and dedication and focus and careful attention and respect um, and specificity that an agency in Massachusetts isn't simply going on the internets and Sorry to say it, folks, but God forbid, just looking for Indian websites that say they're native because it's very easy to make a website on anything you want. <laughs> you can fabricate a whole tribe if you want to, just saying. So you want to be a little more careful, maybe ground truth it, 
maybe come to the tribal administration building, um, you know, maybe view some tribal housing, uh, go to community events, um, you know, get to know folks, introduce yourself, uh, look at people's careers. I mean, you know, theoretically, if they're Native American and also from Massachusetts, they weren't born yesterday. If they're practicing arts, they've been doing it for a while. People know who they are and they've had contributions that they've made in various ways to, to the landscape of New England arts um, and culture. And so I think it's that specificity of knowing the tribes, knowing the people, knowing the types of art, which that statue would not indicate there was any going on <laughs> of, of Massasota, I mean. Um, knowing uh, the, the current art scene, so including the contemporary arts and, and not saying there's only traditional arts, that's the only thing that, that is real, genuine Indian. And if you don't, God forbid, if you don't have dyed black hair, um, so you're, you can't be a real Indian. It's just not possible. You know, so don't impose those kinds of expectations, but then also distinguish between people who are practicing artwork, dedicated artists, dedicated artists and culture bearers, and, and go, for, go for the substance, um, not in an exclusive light way. And of course, if the tribal community, which we generally do, like to mentor, um, and like to bring in multiple generations or definitely like to make a project available to, to our elders or to tribal youth in some way, shape or form or participate in the project, then, you know, help us to make that happen. You know, give us the resources to, to bring in our people um, because it is, it's usually the native audience that, that we're first going for. And then, and sorry to say it, but you know, it's the way it is. Everybody else is, is sort of like the second priority part of that is because we're used to working with our tribal communities. We speak a common language. We have common values and common ways and traditions. We know each other, so we respect each other. And when you get outside of that tribal community space, it's a very different world. The rules are different. And if you're a tribal person, the rules are constantly changing. Like, you know, you can agree to the rules, play by the rules, produce whatever it is you're supposed to produce and have an organization say, well, no, that's not, that's not Indian enough. Um, oh, well, we said we were gonna include your writings, but um, we've decided not to. So you did that work for nothing, but we don't care. And there's no, um, there's no penalty for that awful behavior. Uh, you know, so as a, a tribal artist, you sort of get really good at acting like someone's mom and saying, look, if your mom was in the room, would you be behaving like this? You know, I hate to bring out, bring out the big guns, but you know, if mom has to come, it's fine. I'll bring her. <laughs> um, we're matrilineal. Uh, so, if, you know, for me to say that actually <laughs> means something pretty serious in Wampanoag traditions. But, but again, you know, with the stereotypes being what they are and the education about Native people being so incredibly low and so incredibly inaccurate, um, you know, who knows that here? And I think a thread that I'm hearing between this morning's conversation and this afternoon's conversation is really that relationships are so important to this work um, as we think about our relationship to the land, but also our relationship to the communities um, all around us, the, the Native communities around us, um, that seems to be at the heart of this work that we're trying to do. Yeah, um, Aaron Tani, do you yeah, want to? Yeah, well, I was gonna share um, a little bit of a funny side to that, how our relations are and how um, the Native American communities, we know each other. Um, Elizabeth and I go back a long ways. Her brother and I were, um, we, you know, we were friends since we were teenagers and now here we are, we're growing old and raising kids with, with each other and um, the next step. But um, when we do have to get to those big guns of, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell your relative <laughs> kind of practice, um, there was another curator who was very staunch on or he, he was stern on that he was gonna go a certain way and nobody could tell him what to do even though it was wrong even though it was very wrong and we have a relative in common and um it was getting to be problematic for 
this person's supervisor and my supervisor and it was causing a lot of inner office um, um, strain and, um, and you know non-native people they don't understand um, how our relations work in our families and our our communities and it really got down to the point of oh yeah i'm gonna tell your auntie i'm gonna, I'm gonna go tell your auntie about you and um the subject just dropped after that and so when i told the auntie in common that we have <laughs> she gave us both a talking to and said y'all are gonna have to figure it out but you're gonna have to do right for your communities and you could be big wig wherever you want at the national um level of your curatorial work but if you're doing wrong on behalf of your people we're gonna straighten you out and that's just kind of like an unwritten rule when it comes to our tribal communities but, um, and I come from a Pachalino community, so um, we have headsmen and we have uh, leaders, traditional leaders, and, and that becomes diff not difficult because of their gender, it becomes difficult for when we're working and engaging in the arts because our tribe has also contributed a lot to American art in this country and the identity of what you see sometimes will be beadwork or ledger art, 2D works, will come from the Kiowa tribe. And a majority of us, of us who work in the arts, a majority of us who are curators in museums, um, are females. Um, we, we have the data that says that there are many of us that are um, shifting the paradigm when it comes to representation in these collections. So those conversations become um, intertwined and honoring our cultural practice, but then also moving forward to where we need to be to emphasize that work on, on the playing field out there. But, you know, our, our tribal relations, we want to say that we ultimately don't want to be called to be problem resolution when it comes to organizations. Myself as a curator, as a director of programs, I have no problem authenticating somebody when it comes to um, a arts council who needs to have further knowledge or a grant group who is reading and says, well, this is a major grant that we're going to grant. We need to look into the individual. It's not a problem to do that. So, you know, we want to encourage you if you need to authenticate somebody, tribal nations have no problem with you calling them. Call the tribal enrollment office and ask them, is this individual enrolled? Because ultimately your organization wants to stay on the up and up. There is the Indian Arts and Crafts Act law who says it has, it's a truth in advertisement law that represents our native people. Our native people fought for that law to come into place because the work was being sent overseas or there were other people misrepresenting themselves as native. So our people had to force the hand of the federal government to say, we need this protective law. So we want to help your organization. We want to help your museum, your nonprofit, whatever project that you're working on, we're here to help. So don't, don't think that you're doing something wrong or you're overstepping your boundary. And then the other thing too, if it's going to be a case by case. So you might have a state recognized person or somebody who um, is trying to reestablish their tribe. Well, when we're looking at the arts, we're going to have to really evaluate that and make that a case by case scenario. And Erin can share um, maybe further more on um, the organization she's represented with. But um, I just wanted to share that that point that we all are related somehow. And um, just asking will get you a long ways uh, if, you, if you're game to pick up the phone. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, I, I agree. Indian country is a small world, and it's even a, it's, it's an even smaller world in the Native arts uh, field. Um, I think, um, yeah, as Tani said, there's a legal landscape involved here. And the, um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, you know, which came about in 1990, was a result of just so much cultural appropriation going on that it was having such a horrible um, impact on uh, economic impact on tribal artists that, that you know a federal law was needed to, to stop it. So that's kind of the extent to which we're talking about cultural appropriation as a problem when it comes to native art. So um, 
in thinking about this legal landscape, there's terminology involved there. And um, that terminology, you know, you probably hear a lot of different kinds of terminology when it comes to Native people, different tribes, how, how tribes um, choose to, what they choose to call themselves. But when it comes to sort of like this legal, legal landscape with this Indian Arts and Crafts Act, this American Indian or Native American um, are terms that, you know, ha have to fit a certain standard. And that standard is a federal rec federally recognized tribe. Um, of course, there's other types of um, Native people. There's Native Hawaiians, there's Alaska Natives, there's um, uh, First Nations people from Canada. And, um, you know, it's important to to work with, with artists from many different backgrounds, but um, I guess what I can share about um, what we used to do at the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center, what, what the Longhouse still does, is whenever we're working with an artist, we must have verification on record for who, you know, what their tribal affiliation is. So um, with those who are federally recognized, from federally recognized tribes, those are, fairly easy to do, you know, they have a card or you just call up the tribal office. Um, and then, you know, it's harder for other, for other tribes, for some tribes like in particular in, in California or um, in, in other places where maybe their tribe is not, is state recognized or there's, there's an, a kind of a, a landscape of uh, um, challenges that perhaps that tribe has faced. Like for example, my um, tribe that I'm descended from, um, Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa, that we did not become um, officially recognized as a feder federally recognized tribe until the 1990s. So, you know, federal recognition is a, a long and arduous path for, for many tribes. Uh, some tribes have had it, you know, for a very long time. So I think that, that it's important for, um, I think that the work can only be strengthened by arts organizations sort of learning more about this history and about the, the people that, um, that live here. And, um, you know, we, when, when working at the Longhouse, we have a policy of, you know, we work with people from New Zealand, Maori people, um, people from around the Pacific Rim. And just always, we just had a policy of, you know, just making sure that folks were who they said they were and who had, um, were known and, um, in their communities and that kind of thing. And I just think that's really important to, to make sure and to, to prevent this kind of exploitation that, that does happen. And it, you know, it really does happen a lot. Um, and it's very harmful and it's very hurtful to Native people to have, uh, to have that happen and to have other opportunities and economic livelihoods be taken away by, um, by this, you know, this sort of phenomenon of, of theft that comes along with American culture. So um, I do encourage um, arts organizations to, to also have some kind of a policy in place. Like we want, we, we want you know, more native artists out there. We want them to be you know, native artists or, or you know, we, we want them to, um, to be true. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that in that there are ways, there are a lot of ways, and there's a lot of professionals out there who can also help and assist mm. in the process. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I can't help but think that, think about um, just the complexities of all of this, just because um, in thinking about indigenous communities from other places that have found their way here, so often their existence here is related also to colonization in, in their homeland and displacement, the ripple effects of colonization over time um, and the environmental impacts of our, our current existence impacting their homelands. And, and so I, I recognize that when we're talking about Native arts and indigeneity, there, there is a lot of complexity to, um, to this topic and, but it, at the same time, I think what's at the core of this is um, going back to relationships, knowing um, knowing who you're who you're working with and who you're talking to, and 
and being willing to have those conversations is really important. Um, and another thing, uh, just going back to something that Elizabeth had mentioned earlier, just this idea that um, authentic, <laughs> authentic Native arts isn't just um, the past, that there, there is contemporary art that we should remember and acknowledge as well. And would love for you guys to talk about that a little bit, um, especially as we look forward um, to the future you know, this is making sure that your cultural expression um, isn't just existing today, but it's existing um, for generations um, into the future. And um, thinking about how culture evolves and, and what contemporary Native arts um, might look like today, um, how does that play into this conversation about cultural appropriation? and? Um, are there conversations within your communities about contemporary versus traditional and, and how that plays into to this conversation? Um, yeah, I can weigh in a real quick uh, on contemporary arts. So I think that, um, yeah, I think we have an opportunity when we're, we're working with tribal artists to, to learn a lot more about the depth of culture and the depth of art and that person or that group of artists perspectives and experience and, and um, knowledge. And I think, um, so for me, what's authentically native is, is quite honest, really direct, quite perceptive and the art therefore that one might make might reflect what's going on at the time um, in one's personal life or politically, which is in Massachusetts, oddly enough, um, it still feels very colonized and um, very 17th century. It's really an interesting place to, it's like a time warp. Um, I think, you know, when there's that like strong presence of community and family and knowing the family characteristics and watching those dynamics unfold in a tribal event or um, tribal collaboration, I think for me, that's the good stuff. I love that in my community and when I've had opportunities to travel you know, to New York or to um, Washington State, to Evergreen. I think that's really cool to see some of that in, in action. Um, it's kind of a little behind the scenes in some ways. Uh, but I think that, that that presence of honesty and the humor and um, the, the ability to, to question the, the sort of preconceived notions of what is Native art, you know, what is a Stoic Indian supposed to be making? <laughs> um, versus you know what's real um and what is really a concern what are we really seeing what is what do we really value what are we worried about and what do we want to make sure we take care of to hand down to the next generation um you know environment comes in strong it's it's a huge part of so much of what we do um i think yeah i think it, any creative direction that someone goes in doesn't have to look like some beadwork or um, you know, my wampum or some, some cedar baskets or something like that. They're all really beautiful and they're rich and they have a lot of meaning. Um, but I think that you know, creative expression is creative expression. We, we come from cultures that had a lot of and continue to have a lot of creative freedom. Um, we have to sort of deploy it strategically in the corporate world, at least I, I guess, depending on where we're employed or where we're speaking, but it, it's, it, that sense of humanity, I guess, is what I'm getting at um, that is so strong in, in our arts um, that really transcends a specific time period. Quill work, circa 1680. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's okay to be a modern indigenous person. We're not stuck in the past somewhere and we shouldn't be holding ourselves to, to some odd outside concept of, of what a Wampanoag is, for example, in my, in my case. A, or, you know, or some kind of odd concept of what it is to work with Wampanoag communities, um, you know, which in 1620, uh, the 1620 to, to 2020 anniversary definitely brought out a lot of um, odd concepts into the fore. And, um, you know, for a long time, I was very standoffish and I'm still pretty wary and pretty careful now because people come at you friendly and I hate to appropriate the name, but I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna try to be respectful, but I like end up feeling when I get these requests, like I'm a poseable Pocahontas and they just want me, 
in this series of postcards. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's no, no, no. These are my priorities. You could work with me, <laughs> but under no circumstances will I, will I be authenticating somebody's fantasy um, about what it is to, to be, to have a lived native experience in Massachusetts, to come through the kinds of things we've come through and go through a pandemic again, of course, right? Because it's one flag territory. How could it not just be crazy all the time? Um, it's so complicated and it's really rich and it's really challenging and it's a lot of work to portray um, and to share. But, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's got to be done right or it's not going to be done. So again, the humanity, seeing the humanity of the people that you're working with, respecting the humanity, um, understanding that not all the stories are going to be fun and funny. There's going to be plenty of humor because that's how we process <laughs> deep grief and, um, you know, land displacement and um, so much you know, slavery and, and things like that, things that are just uh, unbelievable, uh, dehumanizing. But, you know, some of the stories are also going to be quite serious and somber. And, um, you know, it's, it's us sharing our truth. Thank you. Elizabeth, I, I, I'll jump in. Um, I guess, for me, it's better to think of it rather as a binary of you know, traditional versus contemporary, but to think of it as a continuum. And I think that what people, you know, should understand is this legacy. It's, it's a legacy. It's a legacy of Native art. And, you know, the body of Native art in America is vast. Um, it's underappreciated. And it's really unfamiliar to most Americans. It's created by lineages of Native artists over thousands of years um, and across, you know, what, millions of square miles. Um, it predates Western colonization here and, and in many cases predates those Western colonizing cultures as well. Um, you know, it's built on each uh, these centuries, centuries of development of, you know, unique tribal histories and cultures and locations and interrelationships and, 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 and voices and um, practices. Um, it's, you know, I guess it's bound by um, geography. It's, there's ancestry. It's, there's a natural hybridity um, between different tribal nations. Um, you know, and, and in later years, resistance to colonization or, um, you know, interaction with, with Western arts, art forms. Um, and I think that that is something that should be really thought about more, that, that it, it's got its own trajectory. Every tribe, you know, and even within tribes, different bands, different clans, ha could be considered to have a canon of their own. Um, you know, set different sets of rules by, by which the creativity is and design is expressed um, and how those techniques are, are accomplished and, and passed along. So that is continuing, you know, that is all continuing. And um, so I, I, I prefer to think of it that way. Um, and as, with myself in that, continuum, you know, what is my responsibility, what is my um, responsibility and goal, and what are my goals in making sure that that understanding of, of what it is, is present in, in the work. I love that, breaking just down the binary. Just add one more thing too, like I, um, our work is in this country always seen in relationship to Western art too. Um, it's seen through this lens of kind of Western cultural superiority. And um, so, you know, that really doesn't do anyone any favors, honestly. Like, I don't believe that that cultural supremacy that we're all subjected to reflects reality. Um, and so I think in my, my work, I, you know, I want to be honest about that. Thank you. 
Um, this is so great to, to think about the continuum, to think about, um, yeah, just that this isn't a binary. Um, I think that's really helpful. Um, and something I, I guess I'm wondering is what, for you guys, what does um, contemporary present, what would contemporary present good native Native public art look like, knowing that we have so many examples of, I mean, just the ones that Elizabeth shared with us at the beginning of this conversation. Um, oh, we'll get into this a little more tomorrow, so maybe I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I, I'm, what I'm hearing is that we need to broaden our understanding of what is and what isn't Native arts, um, recognizing both traditional and contemporary and and the in-between and um, that relationships are at the core of this work. Um, and with that in mind, yeah, I would love to hear kind of what your visions are for, like what, what would it actually look like to see um, public art uh, that is, um, you know, not, not culturally appropriating, not, um, misrepresenting, um, yeah. I guess I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> um, well, misrepresentation comes in many forms, you know, you, we have to be able to ask hard questions who you know who are your folks who are your parents what clan are you um or what tribal community do you come from um what did you study are you studying right now um those are some of the telltale signs that you can um understand misrepresentation and let me be honest um we do have those individuals out there who will invest in a squash blossom or they'll invest in turquoise earrings and just wear the heck out of those things just to misrepresent who they are. <laughs> and, um, you know, as, as an artist, some of the things that we um, include are in our art. And I, and I always want to share with individuals that I believe that my curatorial practice, that's what set, sets me apart from the others is because I grew up with the art. I'm a direct descendant of, of the art that are in these museums and in these galleries. Um, and I also now know how the art practice started. And so I have, I believe, an even more sincere gratitude towards that art practice. Say for instance, Elizabeth or Aaron, um, I, I know that not only just the heart and well-being of what it is to collect those materials and to start and to have that intent, but to also know where that, that's coming from, um, being in that community. But misrepresentation a lot of the times will happen with some, some artists that we'll see because it's so easy to go to Hobby Lobby and get your supplies. It's so easy to go to Michael's and or order your supplies online. So, you know, if you're gonna ask the hard questions to sidestep misrepresentation, do so. Ask the, you know, tell me a little bit more about your process because um, we are finding that it is hard for us to speak up as artists and as curators and uh, funders in a lot of this. So going back to the metrics of how I'm involved that I make sure that dollars are there for these artists to be supported. I make sure that I'm lending accuracy in what they want me to say about their art and why they are important to these organizations. And so when it comes to misrepresentation, it's not that we're talking smack or that we have um, a total beef against an individual or that we um, are xenophobic, but we you know, for me, I want to make it an equal playing ground that we're not just worried about um, gender roles or we're worried about a specific group of social justice. We want to make sure that we're inclusive to everything because I believe in Native art 
that it's intertwined with so much intent from start to finish that we're going to um, be able to tell you authentically where this is going to come from, where we're going, and what we hope to get out of it. So I, I don't know if that's too far off from the original question, but um, that's how I feel that we're going to be able to understand further and avoid those those issues that we come in contact with. Yeah, I appreciate that. Something else that we really value is um, process, that it's not just the end product, which is often a Western perspective of art, that that artistic practice and process is is part of the art and the art making. Um, yeah, I, th I think we're starting to touch upon some of the questions that are popping up in the chat. Um, and one, um, thinking about this also, what are ways for non-Native artists to more authentically collaborate um, and avoid cultural appropriation, um, knowing that, you know, it's probably not going to be perfect, <laughs> that there's probably going to be missteps along the way. But, you know, what, what's some advice you would give um, to non-Native artists who are interested in collaborating and, um, yeah. I think that, um, I think that, you know, working with another artist is, is always a negotiation, um, you know, whether or not that there are cultural differences. Um, and I think also as a native artist working with another native artist, if you're from a whole different cultural linguistic family, and we've got very little actually in common, um, then it's a negotiation of, again, taking the time to know the person, know their art, um, know the context uh, on both sides, right? So I feel like you don't necessarily want to be the colonizer in the art, you know, collaboration. I think as um, the reality of coming from outside communities that are characteristically more apt to colonize, um, were part of the colonization or are part of the colonization and part of the structures, the institutions that, you know, are both celebrated and also are like sometimes the bane of my existence. Um, <laughs> um, it's going to be really easy for one of the two parties to always be the one asking for things and expecting things and making demands and imposing expectations. Step back from that. Um, learn to control yourself. Learn to just be calm and be somewhat receptive and really be a good listener instead of um you know explaining how much perhaps uh you know about native art or culture or history or how you went to my tribal museum or something like that um yeah i mean i think there there has to be a true sense of equality there has to be a, a sense of respect i think with native interactions native american interactions probably common to all of our cultures across the country there is a way of doing things. We, we have old cultures, they go back thousands of years. There's, there's nobody, I, I don't know, maybe there's other cultures in the world. We're very systematic in the way that we tackle things. We have a very, very long view. Um, so seven generations, that's not us talking pretty. That's really our concern. Uh, and that's, that's an understatement by far. Um, so we have this systematic way of doing things. We have protocol. We have ways of doing things. We have things that we don't do. We have ways of appreciating and honoring culture bearers and artists. Um, we mark experiences, we mark places in the land, and um, that all has to be taken into consideration. Um, there's just, there's a lot to it. And so, so be prepared to be respectful. Don't control the pace, don't control, don't, don't try to control. Um, the only thing we need to control as human beings is, is ourselves. Um, so just don't impose, you know, yourself on the process um, and don't overstep. You know, we're, we're good at saying when we know things aren't working out, we'll say, okay, this isn't, this went from comfortable to not comfortable. Now we're going to take a step back and, and have a discussion about things. Um, it, we're going to look at a successful partnership and, and use that as a model. Um, we have experience in doing that. Um, we have ways to safeguard where it, it's a safe and comfortable process and not exploitive and exhausting to the native artist, um, you know, of whatever point in their career they're at. 
uh, so that things work out in a positive way. I think working with an indigenous person perhaps is different. I can't, you know, can't say 100% um, because I've met sensitive people from all over the world. Um, considerate people, people who really, you can tell when they have a conversation, they're really thinking in between listening and speaking. And it's okay to have those quiet, quiet spaces because they're comfortable with themselves and they're comfortable with other people. So I think that, um, you know, as an indigenous person, as a tribal person connected to homelands and here in Massachusetts and Eastern Rhode Island, um, you know, me getting out on the land is a big part of what I do. Um, me having access to certain things at certain times of year is just, you know, it's, it's a matter of course, you know, it's what I do to keep myself in a good mindset, to have a healthy perspective, to really keep myself grounded in the reality here, what's happening with the environment, um, and to have a chance to translate that through my art, you know, and communicate what I'm seeing and feeling and what I care about. Um, there needs to be respectful space for that um, and, and not, uh, any tendency to shut that down or to speak over um, or overshadow or to take um, it's not going to contribute to a to a healthy relationship so sounds like really good advice in general for relationship building <laughs> I can uh, throw something in there um, hang on one second Um, sorry about that. <laughs> I, um, I was actually, you know, I've been thinking about how Western art, there's actually a, you know, focus or like a, a way of working in, in Western art that is about appropriation. That is, you know, it's, um, it's a legitimate form of art that you take from something and you create it and you make it into something, um, else and I think because that is a sort of an ingredient of kind of ways that uh, artists who are who are grounded in western art have been taught that um, it may seem like an imposition of oh you know like when a native artist will say you can't just take that you know you can't just use that um, that maybe this particular image or this particular um, concept is something that belongs to my family or it belongs to like my tribe um, it may seem as an imposition on um, artists who, who have this trajectory, you know, who are following this trajectory because, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, you're stifling my creativity. Um, but I think, you know, it really, again, goes back to what um, Elizabeth has, has laid out is, is respect, respect and, um, you know, and then I also think of like consent, you know, and, um, and reciprocity. What does that all mean when you're in relationship with somebody in a collaboration or in any, any aspect of life? We're all in relationship to each other somehow. Um, so those are kind of some of the things that I think about. That really resonates because as we think about public art, it's, it's um, it's really important that there's relationship in place because um, unlike a blank canvas, a public space isn't a blank canvas. A public space has context. It has um, relationships to people. It has history. Um, it has a future that uh, that's worth considering. Um, so I really appreciate um, your reflections here. Um, I'm going to bring in a question from the audience. Um, Okay, hang on just a sec. Uh, are there any examples of centering Native work in percent for art projects um, in the decision-making process all the way uh, to the installation, um, particularly in non-Native focused structures like schools and state buildings? Do you guys know of any examples, um, good examples of centering um, Native work in, in public art? processes. I think a good example is the um, 
the ironwork, it's a ledger piece um, that's at the Custer um, monument. And um, I, I can't think of the artist, but um, it was unique that it's centered and it, it gives light to who we were. It gives recognition to the importance of both female and male. And then it also um, is on public view for everybody. And that if you take time to actually look at the work, you'll be able to see its intent. So the artist is a female artist. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have the name. I'll have to look it up. But um, it will be forefront to our continued existence. Um, you know, and we always talk about the resiliency. And as Native people, we don't always want to have to be resilient. <laughs> <laughs> don't make a step outside of having to overcome, always overcome. And so um, I think looking at that message in education and public format that it's a National Park Service, but if we're going to look forward to that, you know, make sure that you're not expecting us to always explain resiliency or we're still here. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I, I um, would say too, um, after leaving New England, England and being here in the plain states that it's been um, a hard conversation with the statues. It's been a hard conversation about public art. Um, we did luckily on a few projects um, when there was going to be native influence or native artistry that was going to be on displayed we wanted to make sure that we cleared with the tribal communities and that they gave consent to put forth that artist does that tribal community support that artist who's going to be um, creating this public art it's along the highway um, how many millions of people are going to see it on on the interstate and so that consent is something that we also want to encourage too because we're often strained sometimes by feeling that we're guilted into having to do <laughs> um, a, a certain point of view and um, likewise for new england that i always want to share with you that I will always acknowledge the Wampanoag people and the other tribes that are located in Massachusetts, but there are other artists too. Boston is a metropolis for higher education. So you're gonna get likeness of artists from all across the world who also need to be encouraged. And so we're not saying that take all the opportunity away, but it's also good to share the love because me being a Kiowa person in that space, was not always included when it came to art projects or art granting and so forth. So we want to encourage you to also do that is to look at the other artists who may be of other tribal nations visiting the area or who have made their home in New England or in Boston to say that this is good to include other art forms, not just one specific historic point of view. And, um, we can get into trouble with the word contemporary and traditional and <laughs> medium practice and all that. But um, I, I do want to say that, that that consent has to be there. So if we're, we're going to expect that, then if we're going to make the, the money available, we will say that we do this, this, and this in order to make it right. Thank you for that. Um, I'll pull in another question from our audience. This was asked a little while ago, but um, it says, some of you have mentioned the importance of consulting with Native groups when producing culture-related work. Uh, this question is twofold. Is consulting good, a good enough framework? And if not, what could be an appropriate mechanism to determine levels of participation across stakeholders in these projects. And I think we're, we're touching upon this in terms of the mutual respect, but I, I would love um, if any of you would like to expand on that. 
Um, sure. So I think that um, consultation can can take a lot of different forms. There's sort of the formal consultation that's government to government. Um, so just a just a heads up, tribal nations like to be called tribal nations, not tribal groups. And if you talk to a tribal individual, please don't say you talk to a tribal group. There's just one of me and you're going to get me in trouble when I go home and, and I have to talk to my community and they're like, tribal group, really? <laughs> You've upgraded yourself. Um, so yeah, just, just have transparency in the type of interaction and consultation. Um, ask advice. Um, ask for referrals. Uh, you know, the, you may call a tribal office, for instance, if you, if you wanted to reach out to Quina or Mashpee or any other other tribal, you know, in, in Massachusetts, there's Nipmuc also, there's Stockbridge, um, you know, in, in Eastern New York and Western Massachusetts as well. Um, although many tribal members were removed to Wisconsin, they, you know, still have uh, a stake in, in things in Massachusetts here uh, and a connection, and that needs to be respected. Um, so all of our shared experiences and histories and contributions should be taken into account where possible. Um, I think that you know, I think maybe don't talk to one person, you know, maybe um, take the time, like I was saying before, with the, the developing relationships, when you'd like to represent yourself as having a relationship with a tribal nation, you know, for example, in Aquina, there's over a thousand people. Are you going to talk to a thousand people? Yeah, no, I'm not doing that either. But, um, uh, you know, I, I'm related to enough of them that, uh, that I see a lot of them on a regular basis. Uh, but you know, there, take the time to speak to more than one. Don't um, resist the temptation to check a box, say, you know, I had a conversation with this one person or I ran into this, this guy in the store. Um, you know, don't put us in that spot and don't do the discredit to yourself and your group or organization or, or agency or whatever by, by not getting a certain richness of perspective. Um, you know, we, we know how to work together in our tribal communities. We know how to work with other tribal communities. We collaborate on projects, um, really fun projects, whether it's boat making and canoe trips or um, educational initiatives or conferences um, or, you know, harder things like joint repatriations for, for areas that are lands of tribal overlap where three or four or five nations have, you know, potentially um, connections to the ancestors from a certain place um, or certain time period. Um, all of those, you know, we have ways of negotiating that um, and it's all very respectful and it's all very fair. Um, so have trust in our processes as well. Uh, you know, I know that popular media likes to say Indians and Indians are wild and they fight a lot and this and that and those are stereotypes. They're really harmful stereotypes and um, you know, stereotypes, it's, it's, the, it's the wall uh, that people put up to um, excuse ignoring our humanity um, in our authentic presence, I think. So try to resist any of those temptations. Trusting the process. I really appreciate hearing that. <laughs> I, I also just want to add that we, that all organizations across every sector and agencies and institutions must hire more Native people in actual positions uh, to be a part of those organizations. That's just, you know, I'm just going to throw that out there. That's what needs to happen in my view. Sarah Tani, were, were you about to speak or? Oh, no, I was just making a joke. I said, we're all for hire. <laughs> Resume included. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say quick, um, the, the hiring Native people is the way to keep it authentic, right? Um, because by the time our arts, our words, our priorities, our culture, our cuisine gets filtered through seven layers of non-native people. Um, the watered down sort of, sorry to say it, poor level of like United States curriculum <laughs> is an example <laughs> of that. Uh, it's just not, 
being conveyed properly or in a compelling manner or interesting or engaging manner at all at that point um if you want the real thing if you want the authentic find native professionals and work with native professionals so. thank you so much for that um we are getting close to the end of our session and i just wanted to give each of you some space to share any closing thoughts that you might have um, for the audience as this conversation is, um, has definitely brought up a lot for us to, to think about. We're, we're being too humble. <laughs> Yeah, well, and that is a, a part of our, our culture as Native people. So we we are expected to practice humility um, when we speak. And then so this whole point of where we are as professionals, too, is very hard because we're not used to putting ourselves out there. We're expected culturally at home that somebody else speak on our behalf or somebody push us forward and say, this is who you need to work with. This is what we're going to do. So in this professional role, it's very hard to speak in terms of, I can do this, I will do that. You will see this from me. It's very hard because um, when we go home, the second world that we're, you know, we're, we're stepping away from, we have to abide by those rules also. So it, it becomes very tricky for us as artists and professionals that we have to balance the two worlds and where i come from i am from a very rural southwestern oklahoma community and i have uncles who still don't have running water or electricity in their home and um, people think oh well this is just happening in the southwest well it also happens in oklahoma and other parts of the country but sometimes before i leave there at 5 a.m. in the morning, I've got to make sure there's water for all the relatives, water for the animals, that they're stocked for their food. I get on an airplane and I'm smack dab in Manhattan four hours later. And so I always like to share the example. I, I could be like a hot pot or a hot um, ceramic bowl that if you take it out of its climate too quickly and you set it down and change it, it can crack. And so that's really how I feel sometimes that you remove me from the climate of which I'm used to as a native person. You take me out of that role and you can put me into New York and where I can defend many of you um, when it comes to the arts, that you have to give me that ability and that time to adapt because I'm coming from an outhouse and going to a top tier <laughs> hotel and organization and explaining our arts. And if I don't use the right terminology, sometimes artists can miss out. And um, so I always have, have to share with everybody that we're, we're coming from areas to serve you. And it is, I, I don't want to get too far off on the authentic thing, but we're, you know, it is that much more authentic because we're coming from these communities to serve. And I'm so very thankful that the opportunities have been provided to me in these major cities, um, Boston and New York and um, Santa Fe, Los Angeles, even uh, Chicago and Europe, that um, I'm able to lend that to you. But um, that, those are my closing thoughts to say I'm very thankful to the field of, of the arts. I'm very thankful to NIFA and um, NEMA and the other museums there in New England who provided me not only my experience but provided me um, the opportunity to speak on your behalf and to be that conduit to close the gap and say that from 1950 to present and into the future we need your art and let me assist by sharing with you what I want to so here's two of the artists right here <laughs> that I will always encourage and um, likewise with the presenters tomorrow that that is that's my position and that's my my goal is to always include them so thank you
Thank you for that, Tani. I appreciate hearing you speak. There is, um, I think that some of our characteristics come out of um, having been parts of these communities that go back thousands of years, you learn what it is to work in community with other people to um, create respectful space for everybody in your community to share. And so as a result of that really careful treatment, many of our leaders were styled as being ineffective by outsiders because they thought that we listened too much and gave everybody a chance to speak. But that's what a democratic society is, is all about. Um, they were willing to put in the hard work. Um, and so oftentimes the, the most experienced people are the people who, who aren't putting themselves forward every single second um, because they're, you know, they're busy taking care of community and all too. Um, they have responsibilities and priorities besides, you know, besides the other things too um, that stay very central. I think um, I'm really grateful uh, as hard as things are now um, I'm really grateful to be here and I feel like my my family my life experience um, my dual background in in science as well as traditional arts and culture in the Northeast have given me a huge amount of tools to work with um, they've given me um, ways to experience a lot so I have understanding and a reason to want to communicate a lot about what I'm seeing and feeling and ideas for the future and also ways to bring people together to work towards towards making a better future here in my home territory in Massachusetts and Eastern Rhode Island. Um, this is an interesting time. You know, 2020 is a, for me, it's not a year. For me, it feels like it's become something of a transition point um, maybe a launching board into um, perhaps a much better world potentially if if we all stay in it and and keep working together um, and and work to realize our our visions and our goals for the future and take the time to consider the earth and take care of the earth um, there that reciprocity is really what's going to keep us alive and it's what's going to allow our communities from whatever backgrounds um, in whatever place on the planet really uh, to, to continue into the future. There's a lot at stake, but I think that, you know, by taking the long view um, and thinking beyond what's convenient, that we can make some really important decisions. And I think also if we're brave enough to center art and culture um, instead of you know, having it at the bottom of the list. Um, I'm using the school analogy a lot today. I noticed like recess, you know, recess, the minutes cuts have to be made, the music programs and the recess go out the window for, for kids, um, you know, curriculum. Uh, th you need those to live. You need them to live. They're not luxuries. Um, it's really important to have self-expression. It's, it's really important to, to have yourself and your, your culture reflected in public spaces. Um, it's important to be able to be proud of who you are and then to pass that pride on to the next generation and to, to build your self-esteem and to, to be able to hold your head up. Um, extremely important. That, that's a big central part of our culture and it's what allowed us to be and allows us to continue to be so tolerant of other people and other people's points of view and to work with other people. Um, you know, we, we all have a stake in things here and I think just by understanding that contributions are equally important um, we can go a long way um, yeah so I guess I, I would say that I just want to say thank you so much um, for this moment for and I want to take a, a moment to acknowledge and appreciate my fellow panelists, Elizabeth and Tani, thank you so much for the work that you're doing to push forward um, with Native arts and cultures. I feel like it's, it's not a, that, that this field is so important and what we're doing right now is, is so important and reaches so many different areas of life. Um, they're not separated from each other. You know, it's, it's all connected back to to our culture and and you both are leaders um, in doing what you do and I just wanted to appreciate you for that um, and then just also to say thank you um, to everybody for being here with us today and 
participating in this conversation, for listening in, and to Kim and Kamaria um, for making uh, this whole symposium happen. And um, yeah, just I'm feeling very grateful. Thank you. And I'll just second that. Thank you, Elizabeth, Tani, and Erin. Um, for sharing your lived experiences and insight and knowledge with all of us. Uh, we definitely have a lot to learn from each of you and I'm honored to share this space with you today. Um, we are just about wrapping up our session today, um, but I did want to be sure to make sure everybody knows about tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the slide. Um, we will be gathering for our third and final session tomorrow at 1 p.m. Um, and if you haven't registered yet, I'm gonna go ahead and pop the Zoom registration in the chat so that you can go ahead and sign up. So tomorrow we're gonna to be hearing from all of the speakers you heard from today, as well as Jonathan James Perry and Nia Holly, who spoke yesterday at the Free Symposium event. And our third and final session of the symposium will focus on visions for the future of Native artists um, in public art. Um, yeah, and when you click the link, you can read more about uh, the session and we hope that you'll join us again tomorrow. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.